Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Greetings, it's Hugh Ballou. Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Every Tuesday, we interview somebody that has specific knowledge, specific gifts, specific experiences. Our goal is to help all of us learn as nonprofit leaders and clergy, learn some good sound business principles. Today's show has the, the umbrella topic of philanthropy, but it's a specific area of philanthropy would come under a subset of planned giving. And then there's another subset there, but I won't go any further. Um, I have a guest today who knows a lot more about this and we're not gonna tell you what to do with your money, how to invest or any of that stuff. It's not stuff we talk about here. We're talk, gonna talk about leadership principles and systems to put in place. My guest today is Brian Gum, Crumb, excuse me. Um, you know, I took two weeks off, Brian, and I have to be retrained. <laughs> two, you're two you're forgiven. So you're forgiven. Tell, Happy New Year, Hugh. Tell, that's right. Happy New Year. So fortunately, we got a fresh start. So uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and your background, and then why do you do what you do? What is your passion? Yeah, Hugh, uh, thanks for having us on the show today. It was really a great pleasure having to get to know you better uh, after we met through the C-Suites Network. Uh, my name is Brian Crum, and I work at a company in Scottsdale, Arizona called Caliber. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Caliber uh, before I talk a little bit about myself, because I think it really helps uh, put the two pieces together. Caliber, as a Scottsdale, Arizona-based real estate investment development company, is actively making impact investments in our community. And the way that we do that is on, that on behalf of our investors, who are typically very successful business people, uh, they may have been fortunate enough to have grown and sold a business. And through the wealth that they've created, they have decided that they want to invest back into the community and they want to help create solutions for uh, what may be most needed, whether it's affordable housing or better health care or investing in education and sustainability. The reason I joined Caliber as someone that has had a background in financial services uh, for over 25 years is that I saw it as a way where we could help people to invest directly into the community. Money made on Wall Street gets reinvested on Wall Street. It doesn't go back, or I'm sorry, on Main Street gets reinvested on Main Street. It isn't someone that's a hardworking entrepreneur. They send their money off to a money manager in New York and it never comes back into their own local community. So when I found out about the impact that Caliber as one of the fastest growing uh, small investment companies, not just in Arizona, but in the country was having on the community, I decided to leave my corporate career where I was working as a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch, where honestly, we didn't have the ability to let people invest directly back into their own communities whether it was related to businesses or related to real estate. So fast forward to today, um, one of the things that Caliber has done recently that I'm most excited about is that we have created our own foundation. So now we're tying together the fact that we're making these impact investments in our community, but also we're adding in what we can do through our foundation and our corporate philanthropy. So part of the conversation I'm looking forward to having with uh, with you today, Hugh, as well as our audience, is how can more companies, more people look at ways to increase the good that they do in their community? And we're going to go over some of those different strategies. Wow. I guess the first step um, is a nonprofit leader or clergy. Our, our, our attitude, our knowledge, and our perspective on how money works so I think in coming to the table to have a meaningful conversation, I think it's important for nonprofit leaders and clergy to understand uh, money and investments and all of that. And to understand, we, we get in this habit of, of treating corporate leaders and high net worth individuals um, like an ATM. Give mm -hmm. me some money, give me some money. It's a withdrawal rather than building our system so there's a compelling reason for somebody to want to support it with their, mm -hmm. their financial gifts. So on, on our side, how do we come to the table prepared to have a conversation? 
So I think the one thing to keep in mind is that there's a difference between people that purely just want to donate um, and people that want to get more actively involved in your organization. And that could include finding a way to make an actual impact investment that will support the mission of your organization. And I think a good way to talk about this is using a couple of specific examples. Part of the caliber uh, corporate philanthropy in the way that we utilize, utilize our foundation is when we meet with a community leader, um, in particular in the nonprofit space, what we want to do is we want to understand what are your challenges? What is something that we could do within our network, within our community that we could do to help you address challenges that you are having? And one of the solutions that we can bring to that, we have what is called the Encore Fellowship Program. So these are Encore Fellows that can actually be dropped in almost as a, a, an executive on loan that we can support through the Caliber Foundation. So once we have a better understanding of the challenge that that organization is having, we can start looking at some uh, very creative solutions. And sometimes those solutions are related to finding funding sources, but also it may be a way of helping that organization run more like a for-profit business versus a, um, a, a pure nonprofit where they're looking at it not from the standpoint of being able to put their dollar to, dollars to use in their community, but also looking at it like we need to create a way to be as sustainable as possible. And the more revenues that we can generate, that means that the more resources we have to go back into the services. And that might mean that you can actually create a way for your organization to create revenue streams by providing solutions that typically might be done through a for-profit entity. But the beauty of doing it through a nonprofit is that you have a way to increase your revenues and you don't have the issue of uh, needing to pay taxes on it. So I want more executives in the nonprofit space to realize that if you run your business a lot more like a profit driven enterprise, you can create more sustainability, grow the organization, promote, provide more resources to the community that you serve. And the benefit of it is you don't have to worry about paying taxes on it. That's a lot of stuff to think about. Um, so let's let's clarify some terms now. Before we went live here, I told you that um, I have a, this. Even though we use the term the nonprofit exchange and nonprofit performance uh, uh, 360 magazine that we publish, um, we we also realized that the word nonprofit sets a negative paradigm of scarcity thinking. Mm -hmm. So speak a minute about three terms. One would be how do we reframe it's really a tax exempt business. It's a C Corp, a uh, non-stock C Corp. So talk about that paradigm of nonprofit and moving into an abundance thinking. And also talk about, you use the word philanthropy, give us uh, an idea and you've expanded that. It's not just money. And then the third one is planned giving. So we're, we're in some, some specific areas, but talk about those terms and why are those important terms for uh, a nonprofit leader to know? So let's uh, use a couple of examples. Um, if you're a nonprofit leader and you are trying to provide affordable housing as an example, you don't need to rely on purely getting donations. You could set up a business model where people could invest, they could actually create affordable housing that you would then manage. Now what you've been able to do is you've been able to create a way for people to make an investment into your community and you are going to be able to continue to bring in more money that way because most investors might feel more comfortable about making an investment that will grow and produce revenues that go back into the, um, the nonprofit entity. So I think we need to look at a couple different things. What's the difference between pure donations and what's the difference between making an impact investment that supports the resources of your, um, of your organization? Now you have more capital to provide those services. And if one of the challenges that you're having is bringing in people that understand how to run a business that way, this could be one of the ways where we find one of these Encore fellows that we can basically drop into your company um, until we kind of get you headed in that direction. 
Love it. Love it. So uh, how do you how do you define philanthropy? You know, um, when you think about what is someone passionate about? Some people are very passionate about animal rights. Some people are passionate about children and education. If you're finding a way to creatively support that organization, you're being a philanthropist. Maybe you're doing it with your time. Maybe you're doing it with your donation dollars. Maybe you're truly making a social impact investment that is meaningful to you. Love it. Love it. Because the, the root words are philos, love, and, love. Human, and humankind. Yeah. Yes. Love, love of, love of your brother. Yeah. So um, um, I want to get sisters in there so we don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, planned giving. Uh, we teach at Center Vision there's eight streams of revenue. And one that's not utilized as often as it could be because because many leaders don't know how to even start the conversation or prevent, present the value proposition for um, somebody to even consider leaving. Well, in your case, it's a, it's, it's a cause-based uh, investment that's going to create ongoing value. And thankfully, there's a lot of corporations that are looking at that kind of triple bottom line to make a difference mm -hmm. to the planet and people as well as the profits. So um, talk, talk a minute about um, planned giving and how this fits in into a plan giving uh, scenario. Yeah, this whole conversation actually became really personal for me a couple of years ago when I joined what's called the Planned Giving Roundtable of Arizona. Um, and that was an organ that is an organization where we're bringing in to we're bringing together uh, business leaders that are all passionate about finding ways to continue to create more philanthropic solutions through the plan giving uh, uh, programs. A perfect example is if you are a business owner and you're in the process of selling your business and you want to create your own foundation. How am I going to set that up? What are some of the best practices that I can use? Um, who are the people that I need to engage with, whether it's attorneys, financial advisors, nonprofit leaders, so that I can go from the point of being a successful business owner and a leader in my community to become a philanthropist. And through the plan giving uh, roundtable, which is not just in Arizona, it's actually a national organization. I just happen to be on the board of the chapter that we have here in Arizona. So when I meet someone and they say, I want to find a way to continue to grow in my philanthropy, getting them tied together with the plan giving people at organizations, at nonprofits, at foundations that they can connect with and they can uh, feel that they're supporting uh, the mission that is very personal to them is one of the ways that we can do this. So back to why you're doing this. You left probably a very prosperous profession to do something that was touch, touched your heart. So what is your passion for doing this? But you said it a little bit, but I'd like to, you to talk about that a little more. You're doing this because you're passionate about the work. Yeah, uh, I've got several passions that uh, leads directly into this. Um, one, of, one of them is helping people start and grow businesses, so supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, another one is global sustainability. Um, some of the solutions that are being created, uh, um, uh, dealt or problems that are creations are being solutions, problems that are solutions are being created for are related to what are called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Some of them are eliminating poverty, reducing hunger, creating good health and well being for people, creating quality education, uh, also gender equality. There's, there's actually, I think, 17 different ones. And I identify that almost half of those, I have some level of personal and professional commitment to create solutions, whether that's helping support entrepreneurs that are also going to create jobs and build wealth for themselves and their families. Um, looking for and implementing sustainable solutions related to water, food, energy, air. And a lot of these can be done if you have collaboration, collaboration between the public uh, sector 
the private sector, as well as any type of an organization that is really committed to solving these different solutions. Um, another one is uh, being able to help people uh, have better access to healthy foods. Uh, there are a lot of what are called food deserts in America. You know, we're one of the pro most prosperous countries in the world, yet the pandemic really laid bare how there's a lot of people that are struggling. Uh, I've read recently that up to 20 to 30 percent of Americans uh, potentially are going to bed uh, hungry each night. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are children. You know, what are solutions that we can all create together that really has to start on the local basis? You know, the local leaders are the ones that know where the problems are in their community related to all these different um, uh, different uh, factors. Well spoken, well spoken. <clears throat> a lot of the tragedies are underneath, right underneath our nose, and we're totally mm -hmm. aware of them. Now, I live in Lynchburg, Virginia, named after the ferryboat captain John Lynch. The Quakers mm -hmm. settled this. Nothing to do with lynching, uh, but people died on my property. I look out the window at a cannon in the Civil War, wow. fighting against each other. Um, and, you know, we come to the table, and this was the wealthiest, second wealthiest city in America mm -hmm. before the Civil War. Now we have the highest poverty in the Commonwealth of Virginia, 24.5%. Wow. And, and the Owen zip code is 41%. And we got 26, 27 food charities that are feeding people but the problem is growing before mm -hmm. the pandemic I'm, i don't know what the numbers are now but they're they're so what i'm trying to do is put together some sort of collaboration here to work together because mm -hmm. we're, we're missing we're missing some opportunities and we're we're duplicating um, besides leaving out stuff we're duplicating as well so my 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 vision is homegrown but there's mm -hmm. probably a similar scenario in most every city where people are doing things and we don't know as nonprofit leaders and even clergy we don't know how to put two and two together and make seven by collaborating so so i think your your call to action here is to think about reaching outside of our resources and collaborate yes. yeah yeah we absolutely need to create more ways where people that are in the same community are connecting together um, and what we've seen in the last two years, one of the ways that that is happening is through what is called the Opportunity Zone Fund Program. Um, so I'm going to cover what an Opportunity Zone is, then what the fund is, and then I'm going to tie it together with how we can use this to potentially create some of the solutions, uh, specifically what you just mentioned, whether it's on behalf of for-profit or nonprofit entities. The Opportunity Zone Program is something that was created uh, originally, the concept of it was started back in 2015 by a group of uh, bipartisan senators and Congress people, along with business leaders, including one of the original founders of Facebook. And they were looking at the fact that there are pockets in this country that had not seen the same type of success that other, one, other parts of the country had following the Great Recession that started back in 2009 and 2010. And they identified that one of the common denominators of areas that had started to recover and were doing well and areas that were left behind was access to capital. So the concept was, what if we create a tax incentive for people to actually invest into these areas that became designated as opportunity zones? And when we do that, we believe that we can help create jobs, we can help improve education, access to health care, um, affordable housing is a huge issue across all of America. And then what we just talked about, which is related to food. So in two, at the end of 2017, the Opportunity Zone program was actually created by an act of Congress. And what it allows people to do is when you success, are a successful investor and you sell your business, or it could be real estate, could even be stocks that have a capital gain on them. If you invest those capital gains back into these Opportunity Zones through an Opportunity Zone fund, you don't owe any of those original capital gains to the federal and state government until 2027. So you get this immediate deferral period. The second benefit they get as an investor 
is that they will have the amount of the original capital gain reduced by up to 10% if they invest uh, prior to the end of 2021. Now, where this is really interesting, um, those are two great benefits, but the big impact is after a 10 year investment period where any capital gains that are attributed to those investments in these opportunity zones will actually be distributed capital gains tax free. Um, so I'm going to give a couple examples of how this can be used, and then I want to tie it into how the nonprofit sector may be able to benefit. Uh, and feel free to jump in with any questions along the way. Um, one of the ways that Caliber, through our Opportunity Zone Fund, has been able to make investments in the community using this program. Uh, a year and a half ago, we bought a vacant assisted living facility in Central Phoenix. This was a facility that used to be owned by a nonprofit. Um, uh, they expanded, uh, built a new campus, and this uh, assisted living facility went vacant. Uh, there are homeless people living in there doing drugs. Um, so a little bit of a blight on the local community uh, is in an area that has a lot of medical services available, you know, large hospitals right across the street. And then a, 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 a housing community of historic homes where there's a great sense of pride of ownership. So we had this little pocket of this vacant building. We bought the vacant assisted living facility on behalf of our investors in the Opportunity Zone Fund. And then we fully renovated it and we built a behavioral health care hospital. Now, the same people that may have been living there uh, uh, and having issues with drugs and alcohol can actually come back and through government funding, actually get treatment for whatever may have been causing them to be in that condition. Um, so it's creating great jobs. Um, you know, over 100 medical jobs were being created there and people that had mental health care conditions that were otherwise not getting treatment are able to get treatment, which is now more important than ever. So it was able to create uh, solutions for several problems in that particular area. And it also became a great investment on behalf of the investors that invested into the fund. Now, that's an example of a for-profit entity. How can a nonprofit potentially take advantage of the opportunity zones? Because of the way that these opportunity zones were identified, they were typically in areas that had high levels of poverty, high levels of unemployment. Um, and then each of these different communities, whether it's urban or rural, is going to have a different need, a different solution that can be created. So if the issue is related to healthcare, then whether it's a for-profit or non-profit entity, you can actually use the Opportunity Zone Fund program to build that hospital as an example. Same thing for a school. You know, you could go and build a school for uh, either a for-profit or non-profit um, educational entity and it becomes an investment, but it also brought capital into that community where now they can actually provide higher levels of education that may have been lacking previously. If you are a nonprofit and you're trying to create solutions for affordable housing, um, you could use the Opportunity Zone Fund program to actually build the, uh, the, 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 the housing communities. And this may be on vacant land. It may be coming in and uh, converting a, uh, a, a mobile home park potentially into a, a more sustainable uh, type of housing. So there's a lot of different solutions that you can create using this program. So if you're a nonprofit and you realize that you're providing services in an opportunity zone, one of the things that you can do is reach out to the local Opportunity Zone developers and investors and share with them what the challenges that you're facing and see if there's a way that some, uh, some sort of a collaborative effort, maybe a joint venture could be created um, that would enable them to continue to serve their mission, but create an investment opportunity for the people that want to take advantage of this program. Wow. So, um... Suppose there were a community that had a, a closed school, and we're facing more of those. Um, mm -hmm. And there are communities that have closed churches or synagogues, and those are substantial facilities that could be repurposed. Absolutely. Or uh, some sort of community involvement program, and, a, and they probably had a yard, so you could have a, a 
a local gardening program, which would feed the people and, mm -hmm. and tie in some veterans programs, tie in some, you know, unemployed. So uh, in taking um, an investment to a property like that, the property might not have the highest sale value because some of them are just wanting to get it off their books. Um, so, so is that a good scenario to, to put up there and pursue? It is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> being able to sell property that a nonprofit already owns in an opportunity zone that could be then repurposed is a great example of the program. Um, there, uh, I've definitely seen examples that are happening uh, where old schools are being acquired and redeveloped in opportunity zones. And I've seen the same thing happening for churches. Uh, just like there's a um, opportunity to buy these big uh, vacant big box stores and turn them into urban uh, farms by using vertical farming. I mean, a lot of different creative solutions that you could use. But once again, it goes back to, we have to know about the problem. We have to know about these resources and we have to create that conversation that can lead to the collaboration. So what I heard you say, so let me, let me go more. I want to talk about more about how the nonprofit needs to step up and that person that you would embed in their culture to help a business person. Um, but opportunity, opportunity zones, how does a nonprofit leader find out if there, is it a geographic area? It is, yeah. The geographic areas were actually designated in every single state. Uh, I'm here in Arizona, there's about 180 of them. Um, so, yeah, uh, some of them are large tracts of um, tribal communities. Other ones are very small uh, pockets inside of uh, urban cores. And then um, there's areas like all of downtown Phoenix, as an example, all of downtown Mesa, Arizona. Um, a lot of what is in Tempe, Arizona, excluding the uh, area where the university is. So there are actually maps uh, in every single state. So they could actually go Google Opportunity Zone for their city or state. And it's very likely that a map will actually pop up that will actually show where these Opportunity Zones are. Wow. Um, so we'll make sure this is on the, uh, the podcast site. But um, if you want to find out more, um, it's um, K A L I B E R C O dot com, caliber co dot com. Uh, C A L I B E R C O dot com. Uh huh. What did I say? That one? No, it's a K. It's good. Yeah, that's caliber. Actually, and... we're making it easy. I've got our sign right behind me. Yeah, caliber. <laughs> um, so, and then. Um, do you want to share your email? Is that appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Brian, spelled B-R-I-O-N, crumb, C-R-U-M. So brian.crum at caliberco.com. Uh, always happy to connect with people on LinkedIn as well. Um, you know, for a lot of 2018, uh, myself and other members of our company traveled around the country talking about how opportunity zones can be activated in these different communities. And that was when we started hearing a lot of leaders in uh, rural areas in particular sharing with us, this is a challenge that we're facing. Whether or not we have an opportunity zone or not, what are some ideas that we can create together, maybe even create public private partnerships um, in order to solve some of these solutions or uh, create solutions for some of these problems? Well, actually, that's, that's, that's an area we need to explore a lot more, I believe, because if our senators or congressmen, um, representatives, if we came to them and said, we've got a potential collaboration, public private, and we have a funding source, we're doing things that government probably shouldn't be doing, but they need to help us. Mostly, yeah. maybe sometimes get out of the way, but they, they need, uh, they can help streamline some some different parts of this, licensing and whatnot, permitting. Mm -hmm. So having, having them on board with it. So um, I'm gonna do a commercial here just a second, and then I'm gonna come back. Um, so one of our sponsors, uh, I'm just gotta find it, where did it go? One of our sponsors for uh, Center Vision Leadership Foundation is a company called Easy Digital, and they make an easy card, and it's letters E and letters Z. 
And the Cinevision Easy Card is how you can have in the palm of your hand on your phone um, things about what we're doing at, at Leadership, the Cinevision Leadership Foundation. We provide resources for, we serve leaders who serve communities, who serve people. So we help you do a better job of feeding more people, housing more people. We help you build your teams, build your strategies, and build your funding channels so that when you meet with somebody like, like Brian, you've got your act together and you said, whoa, this is a slam dunk. So if you look here on this tab, so let me tell you how to get uh, Cinevision's easy card. Um, you send a text to a five digit number, 64600. 64600 is where you send the text and the message you put three letters, L, D, R. It's really short for later, L, D, R. 64600 is the number and the message is L, D, R. You get a link and voila, you have this easy card. And if you look here, nonprofit exchange videos, you look down here and here's the one we're doing today, the plan giving and opportunity zone. And lo and behold, here's the video of us talking. So you can have everything that CenterVision does. Now we are able to send texts to people who are in, um, in the community with the card. So the way we encourage nonprofit leaders to use it is to get your more board members in a card, get all your donors in a different card, and you can send them updates and tell them to come to your card and see what you're doing. You want people to be engaged. So this is a relationship building tool. So when you get this card at the bottom is get your own easy card. It shows you how to get yours. So easy card helps us provide our programs by being a sponsor. So get your easy card for Center Vision and we'll stay in touch. So um, Brian, um, when somebody comes to talk to you, so I come to you and say, hey, I got a project. Let's just do, do a case for instance, case here. And I said, oh, I got this food project in Lynchburg. I don't know if Lynchburg is an opportunity zone or not, but it's, you know, high poverty level as, as I've mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah, and, most likely it will have opportunity zones in it then. And we're surrounded by all kinds of pockets of small towns and poverty. So um, if I came to you to talk about it. What would you expect of me and my organization to have together so that you would have some confidence that we could actually pull something off? So let's use the example that um, you're trying to create a solution to the food desert issue. Um, you need to be able to have a business plan or at least put one together. And this is one of the things that, you know, as an example, an Encore fellow could potentially help with. You know, this is the problem that we're facing. This is what we believe a solution could be. And this is how we believe that we can put something together. So you have to show that the need is there. And you're going to have to show that there is a business plan in place that can be properly executed. And then you're also going to have to make sure that the um, uh, we know how these services are going to be paid for. So if it's selling food, is it going to be selling food and you're going to put contracts together with um, local businesses saying, hey, we're going to build a an urban uh, uh, an urban agricultural business. And we're going to do it inside of this vacant building that is otherwise underutilized. So growing the food is one thing. You have to have a way to sell and distribute it. And if it's being done purely through a, um, like, uh, 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 a food bank, you know, is there, a for, is there a business model where the food bank is then going to be able to not just only survive based on donations that are then going to be used to buy the food that is grown, but can we create, let's say, a food incubator, you know, a, a shared commercial kitchen where now entrepreneurs that want to start a food related business can actually buy the fresh food from the urban farm. Now they'll have a shared kitchen that they can use to actually cook it. And then you have to have a way to get people to buy it from you. So that would be an example. You know, how far along is your business plan for this? Um, what are the different challenges that you may have? Um, an example could be that, hey, I would love to be able to grow this food and sell it to schools in the local area. 
But when you go and you talk to the school, you find out that they have a long-term contract with another food distributor that may actually be shipping food in from hundreds of miles away. So you have to understand where the challenges are going to be with this particular type of a business. So that's just one example. Um, you know, look at the business plan. Is the need there? Where will the, um, uh, you know, who are your customers going to be? How are they going to be able to afford it? Uh, so that, that would be one thing I would, I would take a look at. So the, the model that I see in most cities is there's a, a food service that actually gets food donated from the grocery stores when it gets within a certain date mm -hmm. they, and there's there's a lot of food that's distributed um, and it's totally given away and people qualify so they don't go from one food service to another and load up so there's a there's a screening process but basically they get people food and they go home so as you're talking i'm thinking there's there's no collaboration except give us money or give us food there's no collaboration and there's no addressing the uh, the mindset of poverty the opportunity to build something that you can get yourself out of the situation you're in because a lot of these people don't want to be in the situation but they don't really understand alternatives so you think about we have a lot of services giving away food our poverty level continues to increase mm -hmm. we have people if you're hungry on a friday afternoon and you don't have a car there's nothing open to get food and there's no way for you to get food to you mm -hmm. So there's there's a number of issues here. So as you're talking, there's there's and what I see that you do is you bring um, a greater perspective of thinking out of the box. We don't just feed people. Is there a bigger initiative that there's a bigger win-win and creates a more sustainable uh, result over time that mm -hmm. then would build some jobs for small businesses and maybe employ some of these people who are needing food. Um, they can find a pathway to get employed. So speak to creating a bigger bigger solution than what we're doing right now, would you? Yeah, absolutely. So the, what you just talked about is the example where don't just give someone a fish, give someone a net, give them the tools that they need to actually go get more fish. Um, and that's why I really like that business model where the food bank, um, as an example, um, can move into a business model where now they are creating that shared kitchen. Um, they're offering educational opportunities to actually teach people how to create small gardens, um, even maybe in their apartment. Um, you know, you could do a small vertical wall where at least some of the healthy food could be grown there. Um, so you have to create um, educational opportunities for people to learn how they can move away from this, the, the situation that they're currently in. And then, um, I've seen uh, several business models where foundations are using uh, land that they own to partner with the community and build these co-working, uh, these um, collaborative spaces where you have a shared kitchen. So you've got the community garden, you've got the shared kitchen, you're helping people create their own jobs through entrepreneurship by creating a food-based business without a lot of capital outlay. Um, you know, it's very expensive to open up a restaurant, but if you did it inside of one of these commercial kitchens, now you're teaching them how to become a business owner. Um, so those are all some of these solutions that can be uh, implemented, but you have to get away from the traditional thinking of getting donations and distributing and finding that way based on who is in that community, what are their interests. Um, uh, I've seen businesses that are specifically created where they employ people who have disabilities, uh, maybe autism as an example. Um, there is a, uh, an organization here in Arizona that they hire people on the autism spectrum to actually um, uh, grow and uh, then produce different types of food related businesses. Um, so now you've helped create jobs for more people um, and you're absolutely creating the solution of uh, bringing more healthy, affordable food into a neighborhood. The number of, um, you can, it's actually um, a business generator. Mm -hmm. like, it's not a, like a tech business incubator, it's a generator. You're generating small businesses that employ people. So there's a transportation piece to this. There's a, um, an education piece of this. How do I educate myself for the job that I want? 
-hmm. And all those businesses need a successful business plan and some sort of source of micro loans to get started. Yep. Um, so you've touched on several, we teach at Center Vision, there's eight streams of revenue. Um, and one, one is certainly 70% of nonprofits, 65 to 75, get the majority of their funding from donations. Mm -hmm. But that's one of eight streams of revenue. And we think, oh, we're going to get a grant. Now, this potentially, we haven't talked about grants, but there could be a startup grant for putting something together. But planned giving is one that we don't really take advantage of on, on a scale. And for somebody who's got high net worth to create a sustainable program in their name is creating a legacy mm -hmm. that leaves a permanent imprint. So, so um, and then when we didn't touch on that you you sort of alluded to, you don't have to have a business to, to have business generated revenue. You can have earned income from your nonprofit. We're, we're shy away from that because of the word nonprofit. We're not supposed to make money on stuff, but we can oh, sell ways to, you're, to you're, su you're supposed to make as much money as possible. Yeah. You have the benefit of never having to pay taxes on that money if you do it the right way. Well, and we're afraid of business generated income because unrelated business income is treated by the IRS as a taxable event. However, mm -hmm. what you're talking about is generating stuff that's mission related. Correct. And so it is. It, it, that doesn't come under that too. So, so what you're doing is putting together a whole bigger piece that benefits more people and ultimately becomes more sustainable. So what, what I see over and over is we think too small. We're going to do one mm -hmm. little thing with ourselves instead of let's put all of the people together. Maybe they're not even competing. There's a transportation piece. There's a business yep. advisor. There's a, there's somebody representing from the, the city. There's somebody from the community foundation. There's somebody from the university. So you know we put together the good brains and we build this this bigger initiative. And then we start it one step at a time. So back to me. If I approached you, a you would want me to have a plan. Mm -hmm. It says I want. Here's what the result's going to be. We're solving this problem. Here's how we we show up our uniqueness in solving the problem that nobody else does because we've looked at the competition. So mm -hmm. it's the unique value proposition we have. Yep. And then here, here's the intended results, the impact of what we're doing. It's going to impact people's lives. And then you've just added an element to this about to the impact piece. There's an economic impact piece and a self-sufficiency impact that we're we're getting more people employed. So this requires a whole lot of coordinating and a whole lot of planning. So, oh, and one other piece that we didn't touch on yet that you alluded to was in-kind donations. Having a person is a corporate in-kind donation. Yep. Now, they don't get a deduction for that, but it is one of the sources where we save money. It's one of the eight, eight sources of, of funding. And we don't spend that money for that executive because it's an in-kind donation. So there's there's several ways that in kind donations can help. Not only that person provides a function, but they bring a whole network of connections with them, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of that model. Um, and I, I, I would say to if you are a nonprofit leader in your community and you don't know what resources are available from the companies that have a corporate philanthropy piece, you need to start those conversations and share with them what challenges you're facing and just ask, do you have someone that you would recommend? Maybe it's someone within your own organization that could on a fractional basis, just instead of just purely volunteering their time on the weekend, um, they would be able to do it maybe as part of that company's um, paid time off program. Um, that's one of the things that Caliber uh, makes available. Um, anyone at Caliber at any point could uh, do paid time off related to charitable causes. And that could include them you know, be, becoming one of these fractional, fractional executives or experts that can solve some sort of a need or a challenge that the nonprofit is having. Yeah, so once again, once again, it goes back to collaboration. You have to start the conversation because as a corporate executive, you may not know what the internal challenges are of these organizations. So you have to have those conversations. And maybe that means that you uh, openly reach out when you're at a, a networking event. Um, you know, a lot of nonprofits are members of the Chambers of Commerce. 
Now, share in those chamber meetings as an example. What are some of the challenges that you're facing? Is there someone in your community, your organization, that could help us figure out what that challenge is? So um, let me just kind of go down to the questions we had on the radar. I just sort of got into some different things. I will say to you, uh, this is a very eye-opening um, interview with lots of uh, really incredible information that's very valuable. So um, we're at the beginning of a new year. So here's a couple of questions. You've covered some of it, but let me just kind of go through it step by step. So we're, we're um, at the beginning of a year. Um, so what kind of planned gifting strategies do you see your clients doing leading up to the end of this year? What do you think is going to be present? Um, the one that uh, has really kind of changed in the last couple of years is the ability to actually incorporate an investment into an Opportunity Zone fund into the estate planning that is being done when someone uh, either sells their business or another asset or is potentially looking at, um, you know, how am I going to pass everything on to my heirs? So if you are not working with a CPA, an estate planning attorney, or a financial advisor that understands how there's these additional tax and investment benefits of an Opportunity Zone fund that can be incorporated into your plan giving strategy, um, that is something that I'd be more than happy to have a conversation about and potentially help them identify um, you know, an estate planning attorney or a CPA in their community that could help them implement something like that. People you work with, are they um, individuals? Are they family offices? Are they family office foundations? Who are they primarily? Yeah, all, all the above. Um, it's mostly been individuals. So, um, you know, a couple examples, uh, a family has started and grown a business that gets acquired uh, as part of that, that transaction. Uh, they decide that they're going to start a family foundation, but they're also going to do some estate planning and set up certain charitable trusts that they can then um, make impact investments through the Opportunity Zone program. Um, so uh, the family office model is very unique as well, um, because that is typically a family that has already had their wealth created. It's not newly being created, but they have to find uh, innovative ways to invest that money. And a lot of those family offices are starting to look at the, uh, or have already been looking at the social impact in the ESG or environmental uh, sustainability and government's aspect of the investments that they actually make with their money. Um, and part of that could be identifying how does an impact investment in my community not only help us take advantage of these tax benefits, produces income and growth opportunities, but is also providing a solution for the need that they see in their community, um, whether it's related to poverty, lack of quality education, um, uh, or what we talked about related to helping people uh, start and create jobs that can build wealth for themselves. And it can all be tied together. And it's a triple win. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A win for the profit, a win for the investor, and a win for the community, humankind. Um, any more you want to say about how opportunity zones can be integrated in someone's particular estate plan? Um, you know, the key to that uh, really goes back to making sure that uh, they have a team in place, their CPA, uh, their estate planning attorney, and a financial advisor that understands what goal that family uh, or individual is uh, trying to achieve. Um, and if they aren't familiar with how the Opportunity Zone program works, then uh, someone like myself um, is always happy to, um, you know, learn more about their situation and then help their, uh, their current financial advisors better understand how this can be uh, implemented on their behalf. Because like I said, it is a brand new program. It's only a couple of years old. And our company is one of the first ones in the country to actually create an Opportunity Zone fund that is actively investing in entrepreneurship, education, healthcare, um, and then looking for other, uh, other uh, community-based needs that fit this type of an investment. So we had record low interest rates last year. How is that going to impact the future of this kind of strategy? 
yeah, the, the low interest rates because of the way that the tax crediting program works um, actually is very beneficial for this program. Um, the other the other benefit of the low interest rates is that it's actually creating a, a bigger incentive for people to invest into real estate in their community, which creates income from the rents that come off of it. Um, so if you've got record low interest rates, you can buy and build more at, with, with cheaper interest rate loans, and you can create a higher level of income off of real estate than you can typically on money that's sitting in the bank or in bonds and things like that. So we got to get to it. So um, we got about five minutes left, and uh, are you willing to entertain a question? Absolutely. I would love to. Okay. Um, talk about philanthropy. Here's the author of Philanthropy Misunderstood, a book you should have in your waiting room there is a coffee table book philanthropy misunderstood.org uh, bob hopkins who's on the line from dallas texas bob you raised your hand have you got a question well i do i'm Thank unfortunately you. i missed i missed a little bit about this um but um brian um of course there's there are not a lot of companies actually that have an arm that is of social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. like you're talking about uh, many times you have boards of directors who say, why do we want to give our money away? Personally, we can give our money away, but why does the company want to give our money away? What are the advantages to a corporation besides taxes, besides feel good, um, to, to actually become a giver like you're talking about? That is a great question. And it's actually one of the reasons why uh, Caliber started the Caliber Foundation and uh, the way that we're approaching corporate philanthropy. And one of the, the, the best reasons to do that is that your younger employees in particular, um, this is very, very common with millennials. They want to be more involved in philanthropy, but they're not the, they're not the point where they can write those big checks, but they wanna be directly involved. And if you can help them do that through volunteership or, um, by bringing to the executives of that company the causes that they support. Now you're making those donations on behalf of uh, uh, organizations that your uh, employees are passionate about. Um, so greater, greater uh, engagement with your staff is a great reason to do it. Uh, that's just one example. Um, another one would be we have seen that people want to do business with companies that care. So now we're talking about not just creating a program that is going to donate money and, and, and provide these other resources, but make sure that you're sharing the story. Um, so there's a, there's a PR opportunity um, that you're doing so that not only do your employees know that you're doing it, but also your customers. Um, so if you're a company and you're trying to compete with business and your competition has a corporate philanthropy program, there may be some customers that want to do business with them uh, because they see that they're creating solutions for problems in their own communities. Right. You mentioned earlier, Brian, that there's, uh, this is uh, an investment opportunity too. There's, there's a, a, a profit stream here as well. Yeah, if, 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 if you make impact investments versus the, the, the pure donations. Yes, correct. Okay. So there's more than one way to approach the conversation. Bob, did that answer your question? Yeah, I did. And I do know that the retention of your employees is at a greater, as at, is higher when they know that they're giving part of their mm -hmm. money away and, um, and getting them involved in the community is, in a, major, is a major aspect of that, that program as well. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, great question. Love that, Bob. Bob always has great questions. Thank you, Bob, for, for being here today. So, um, Brian, um, this has been a very helpful interview. And for people listening, they can go to the nonprofitexchange.org, T H E nonprofitexchange.org. And you can find all of the seven years worth of these interviews. And I will say, we've never had anybody like Brian. Um, on the on the show, have, people have talked about pieces of this, but you've got a, a really mind expanding way to think about strategies that are current, and you're on top of what uh, what's the win win for everybody. So uh, thank you for offering that. I'm going to do 
another another sponsor moment, and then um, going to leave it to you to, to before I do that. Is there something we haven't covered that you wanted to highlight before we we close out this great interview? You know, the the one thing I did want to share is that a lot of foundations actually don't make pure uh, true social impact investments inside of their investment thesis. Um, they might have a investment committee uh, made up of people that are used to making very traditional investments in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, but they don't really know how to incorporate real estate and true impact investments um, that are profitable um, and into their investment um, um, thesis. So that's also something that I love having conversations with um, uh, nonprofit leaders about true impact investments as a part of their endowment potentially. Well, it would occur to me that many, many, many local nonprofits have local business leaders and sometimes their their branches or even home offices of national corporations. Uh, like here in Lynchburg, we do have some national companies and we do have some of the local employees on um, some of them are the home office, some are not. Mm -hmm. but we do have some of the employees on local boards. Yep. And so that's a, it's an education piece for both sides, I would think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if people object to stuff, it's, uh, it's um, you know, they need some information about it. So I'm going to do a sponsor moment and come back to you and let you leave a final thought or a tip or a challenge for nonprofit leaders. But one of the, the things that we do is, um, Nonprofit Performance 360 Magazine. Here you can see a previous issue with Frank Schenkowitz, who founded Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, that is a sustainable legacy that's still mm -hmm. going on. And he wasn't even a nonprofit leader. He was a motorcycle policeman. And, and so he started this charity because he had a passion for things. But um, it's print, it, we publish it as printed by Word Sprint. And Word Sprint um, helps nonprofit stay in touch with their tribe. So it's 30% of your message is the right message to the right person, 30%, in the right frequency, 30%, and the final 10%, it needs to look good. So Word Sprint, just like it sounds, Word Sprint is the company that prints this, but it's, it's a mailing house, not just a print shop. So wordsprint.com is the company that helps you maintain the relationships with your support system. They get something in the mail. It's not email. They get a follow-up email. They get a call from you, but they get something in the mail. It's really quality. Tells them about the impact of the work that you've done with their dollars. So stay in touch with your tribe. Bill Gilmer and his team at WordSprint will be happy to share information whether you use them or not. WordSprint.com. Tell them CenterVision sent you to talk to them. They're the best in the game. So Brian, what do you want to leave people with today? I want people to create more conversations. Share what your challenges are, share what your opportunities are, create collaboration. And it all starts with being open and honest. You know, uh, what are the challenges that you're facing? And uh, how do I connect with people that care about that? So create more conversations. It's behind, underneath communication is relationship, underneath leadership is relationship, and relationship is why people invest in you or do business with you or collaborate. You've opened up lots of really helpful topics with really great suggestions. So um, you and I met uh, on a group in the C-Suite Network, and you asked to talk to me, and then we said, hey, you should be on the show. So thank you for saying yes and beaming in from Scottsdale, Arizona to be with us today. Uh, Brian Crum, um, his company is Caliber, and it's Caliber Co. C A L I B E R. Is how you spell Caliber Co. dot com. And then on the uh, on the page for the nonprofit exchange, you'll see um, his email and the company's link, and you can go there and find out about what they do. And he invited you to call and have a conversation. So that will be a good thing to do. Email him first. So Brian, thank you so much for being our guest today on the nonprofit exchange. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much for offering me this opportunity. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too.